Welcome, everybody, to episode 39 of the Hulf Majority. Yes, that's one before 40. One before 40. And today we've got a special rerun conversation of an episode we had actually with Deke Copenhaver. It was episode 11. And the reason why we're releasing this is one is because the show's grown a lot. And since last August, we've got a lot of new people joining, amazing new folks like you. And I think there's some conversations you ought to hear. But here's the second reason that conversation is about the power of local politics, about the fact that amidst all of the attention that's being focused on the presidential election, which is, yes, important, we forget that the real action, the real work, oftentimes the policies, the impact, what your child is learning at school, what happens to the local road down the street, what happens to uh, how even our trash gets picked up, what happens to the potholes. All that stuff happens at the local level. In fact, I think in some ways, democracy is most exercised at the local level. And who better to hear that message from than the past mayor of Augusta, Georgia? He was mayor for nine years. He worked with Republicans, worked with Democrats, and importantly, Deke Copenhaver represents a real image and insight into what local politics can do for how our democracy actually functions in a year where we're all focused on national. I hope you enjoy this conversation. Remember, every Monday, YouTube, Spotify, Apple, wherever you get your content, you can watch us, you can hear us. And importantly, we're building this platform with you because we're trying to build nuance, fight outrage. There's an outrage industrial complex out there, and we have to figure out how to have nuanced dialogues about issues that matter to all of us. So without further ado, let's get into the monologue, and then we'll hear from Deke Copenhaver himself. All right. The power of local politics. What is the promise of local politics? What I mean by local politics, by the way, let's just define that. I mean, city council, school board, mayor, township, local police department, sheriffs, you know, all of the stuff that actually affects our lives that we never really talk about. Instead, we only focus on the United States president, which is important. But believe it or not, the actual impact on our lives, the decisions that have the most tangible impact on our lives happen at the local level, and yet we never talk about it. So maybe there's hope in talking about this. And by the way, if you're on YouTube and you notice a location switch and you notice me interviewing our amazing guest who's gonna be coming up, Deke Copenhaver, former mayor of Augusta, Georgia for nine years, knows a thing or two about local politics, you'll notice that there's a different location for the monologue as opposed to the interview, and that's because I'm in Boston today. And yet you know, the hopeful majority is not stopped by location, by travel, it runs on, the show goes on. And so I'm so excited for you to join me. Here's why I wanted to think about this topic, because I know it's a little nitty gritty. It's not as flashy as Martin Luther King, which was last week's episode, by the way, King of Life. Person who wrote that book, Jonathan Eig, that book was just featured on Barack Obama's summer reading list. So if you're interested in that, check that out. But why local politics? Well, I think it was four weeks ago, I was at the Constitution Center in Philadelphia, right across from Independence Hall. I learned something. I wanted to share this with you. I learned that the current constitution of the United States is actually not the first constitution we had. In fact, you say, Manu, what was the first constitution? I, well, that's what I asked. 1781, Articles of Confederation were ratified by the United States Congress after our Declaration of Independence was, was, was uh, ratified by Thomas Jefferson and written into, in a practice by Thomas Jefferson, Ben Franklin, and all those amazing founding fathers, John Adams, Alexander Hamilton, etc. You know, the Articles of Confederation were written in, and our modern conception of the United States Constitution was actually ratified in 1789. So I have to do some digging for you. So why is that? Why is that? Why is there a difference? Articles of Confederation were deliberately written to enforce and empower a weak central government. It was essentially, honestly, the way I understood an MOU between 13 different colonies, a memorandum of understanding. It was just a, it was a written agreement. And and part of that reason was was obviously that the the founding fathers were were traumatized by the monarch in England by being overly cautious about enforcing a strong central government. But secondarily, they're very focused on empowering the states and the colonies. And why was that beyond just a weak central government? Well, when I did some of the research, I mean, obviously. I'm sure some of you have heard of this notion of the 50 states being laboratories of democracy. Well, in this case, it was not only trying to empower states to make decisions that mattered most to them, but it was an emphasis on local politics, on the localization of American politics, on federalism, on this idea that perhaps local decisions, local politics are not only more impactful for the people that live there, but are 
more tangential and related to our lives, it's less susceptible to polarization and toxic party division. Well, the Articles of Confederation were then replaced by the United States Constitution, which was officially ratified in 1789, March of 1789. And while that constitution strengthened the federal government, it still maintained a very strong emphasis on local politics. And in fact, I actually think that local politics offers a serious way out of our deep, devastating polarization. Why is that? Two reasons. First, as we've talked about on episode four and episode five, about the incentives that our political leaders have at the national level. The incentives just don't align to actually solving problems. The incentives to getting elected are there to divide you. All of the incentives point to the direction of division, and none of them point to the direction of actually solving problems. Because if you want to get elected today, you want to raise more money, you want more listeners in your podcast, hashtag the hopeful majority, say the crazy stuff, divide people. Who cares about solving problems? All that matters is that you focus on the news headlines, Twitter. Well, guess what? Local level, incentives are different. We'll get into why. Number two, local politics are less susceptible to polarization. And this is really the th- reason that I want to focus on the power of why I think we need to invest in local. But let's first go to incentive number one, point number one, that incentives are aligned to actually solve our problems. Think about the local decisions that policymakers are actually focused on. What it, What is your city council member focused on, your school board? They're focused on your curriculum that your kids are learning about. They're focused on the pothole down the street, the trash cleanup, whether or not the local shopping mall should be built. What is the local business tax? Who is the sheriff? Who's the police department? Where's our funding going? All of those decisions that actually, you know, make a difference in our lives, that actually change and affect how we live our lives, that affect our kids' lives and their development, are not made at the U.S. presidency level or even Congress or Senate, but at your mayoral office. And the fact is that if you're going to be running for that office, your incentive is to actually solve the damn problem that your constituents are electing you to solve. Because you can't punt to national media. You're not going to get CNN interviews where you're pontificating about the next election. No. Is the streetlight down the road fixed or not? If not, you're going out of office. Does the curriculum that the school board's teaching align with what I care about as a parent? If not, you're getting out of office. I don't care about where you stand on, you know, Donald Trump or Joe Biden. What I care about is, is the 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 shopping mall that guarantees thousands of new jobs in my local community opening or not? If not, then you're out of office. Is the local coal mine down the street going to have continuous permits? That's what local incentives are driven towards. So why not try to revitalize local politics? And here's point number two, I think, the point that really offers hope at this moment. Local politics are less susceptible to polarization and the nationalization of our races. Here's what I mean by that. What are some of the biggest culture wars that affect our society? What are people voting on? Free speech, trans rights issues. The local, you know, the 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 question of whether or not we're arming Ukraine or not. You know, what, what did Donald Trump's latest tweet have to say? Where did the Democrats and Republicans stand on X, Y, Z issue? Well, the fact is that the local pothole down the street, I don't know what the Democrats have to say. about. I don't know what the Republicans. Have. I'm just going to vote for whoever's trying to fix that pothole. Right. Local issues are not nationalized. Because these days, we have such a habit of voting out of our party line. We're like, what did the Democrats say on this? What did the Republicans say on this? What's my side? Da, 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 da. I'm going to vote for that side. I'm going to vote for that issue. Well, guess what? I, I don't know what the, the, the national Democrat, I don't know what Nancy Pelosi is going to say about the, the red light and whether or not it should stand down my street. I don't know what Mitch McConnell has to say about the local small business closing or opening. I might be able to infer, but our local politics are inoculated from the nationalization of our polarization. And yet those national issues are slowly seeping in, slowly seeping in. I'm going to give you a quick story. In 2019, at UC Berkeley, I was a junior, and we held a debate, a Braver Angels debate. One of our partner organizations at Bridge USA, Braver Angels, we held a debate. The debate was about homelessness. Is about whether or not the university should be able to construct new housing on a territory called People's Park that a lot of homeless people claimed as their territory to stay in. We had 
people with homeless students show up. We had the homeless people that lived in People's Park show up. We had uh, uh, students that believed in building the housing. We had students that opposed the housing. We had everybody there. And what was so fascinating about this conversation was not once did Donald Trump's name or Joe Biden's name or Kamala Harris's name or Democrats or Republicans, none of it came up. It was entirely focused on the merits of whether or not we build housing. That was it. And whether or not we weigh the concerns of the students or the homeless people, how do we measure those two concerns? It was a legitimate policy debate. I know shocking in today's environment, absolutely shocking, crazy to think about that we could actually operate in a world in which we have a legitimate policy disagreement. It was substantive. It was empathetic. It was kind. It was focused on solving the problem, not scoring the next headline, because frankly, CNN doesn't care what Berkeley's student building policy is. What they care about is whether or not you knocked that Trump in that last debate. And what that showed me is the power of us as citizens actually investing locally. Yes, it's important to participate in our national elections, but the fact is that the U.S. president has very actual little impact on our material life. I mean, short of a few catastrophic decisions that they can make about war and national tax policy, which, by the way, takes a couple of years to implement, really, the effect on our kids, on our food prices, on our lo- that happens at the local level. And our national parties want politics to not be local. They want it all to be nationalized. They want everything to be down ballot. They want the city council person to be dictated and and run based on whether or not the state senate is elected, based on whether or not the U.S. Congress is elected. But we have to devolve power back to local. And I think this hunch is particularly interesting to think about as it comes to our next guest, Dee Copenhaver, who was the mayor of Augusta, Georgia for nine years. And we get into the intricacies of whether or not he thinks this thesis of local politics is promised because our founding fathers envisioned a country in which not giant national parties ran everything and mob bosses and political bosses and the establishment and the folks determined what happened. But in fact, what they envisioned was a world in which the everyday citizens' concerns were being met and importantly, that our natural rights were being protected by our institutions. That was it. So should we go local? There's only one way to find out. Let's welcome Deke Copenhaver on to the next segment of the show. Stick with me here because we're about to get a former mayor's perspective and importantly, a former mayor who's become a dear mentor of mine, somebody that's going through some interesting and challenging life moments. And yet he's got the hope and optimism to deliver what I think is a productive vision for what local politics ought to look like. Let's hear from him. Deke, welcome to the Hopeful Majority, sir. Thank you for making the time. But, man, thank you for having me. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Deke, you know, you're somebody that has taken so many hours out of out of your, your life over the last couple of years since we first met just to, to provide input, to provide advice. You've got such a positive spirit. Um, but before anything, let me just ask you, uh, as you made the time to, to get on, you know, the name of the show is The Hopeful Majority. And something about hope is having a lot of purpose, having a yeah. good answer to the why. and I would love for you, if you're okay with it, to share with the audience before we really get into the conversation about, you know, how you've approached your life, your thought processes, your ideas over the past couple of months, um, given, again, just the personal challenges that that you're experiencing. Yeah, ma'am. No, you know, Mano, it's, it's interesting. Bridging has been basically my life's work as an adult. I did it for nine years in office as mayor of Augusta. I've done it, you know, through a best-selling book, but on April 19th, I was diagnosed with esophageal cancer. And, you know, at first, I mean, you're, it scares the hell out of you. I'll just be perfectly honest. But I'm like, man, I'm not going to let this stop me from using my voice. Because I'll tell you, to me, cancer is a common ground issue, right? I don't know a single person who, them personally, a family member, a friend, has not had to deal with it. So I think it brings us together. There should be some sort of a common understanding that everybody has dealt with this disease. I'm dealing with it personally. I'm doing very well. But, you know, that our humanity should be what binds us, my personal opinion. But, you know, I'm just not going to... I am doing extremely well. I've been so blessed. Five and a half weeks of uh, radiation and chemo treatment never lost any hair, never lost any weight. But I, th- I will say, 
it goes to your hopeful majority. I think a positive outlook, given my current second, my current situation, it helps a lot. Let me, you know, your point about just, I mean, you said that you haven't lost weight, you haven't lost hair. I mean, you have, it seems like you haven't lost your spirit. And yeah. just before we were getting on, literally, Deke, uh, two days ago, I got my hands on a book that many folks in the audience might know by Viktor Frankl called Man's Search for Meaning. And when I was prepping for this conversation, the question that I really wanted to ask you is, how has your outlook on life been shaped by this diagnosis? Because, I mean, you, you, you bleed with optimism. Um, so, so how has your outlook on life been shaped by this? Well, it's, it's interesting. And you mentioned Victor Frankl. One of my best friends is a psychiatrist. And so I texted him last week from Houston, from my visit to MD Anderson, saying, you know, I've been given this phenomenal opportunity to really reach more people now probably than ever and to have more impactful of a message. So he quoted Victor Frankl when I texted him that. But it, but it is true. You know, it's, I realize that everything in my life, everything in life has a purpose. So I know that I can use this for great good to have an impact on people and to say, you know, life is too short. And I'll get into extreme polarization. When I think about, you know, it's a cancer in and of itself because it's impacting families, communities. You know, people are losing friendships over it. We need each other and we need this interconnectedness. But extreme polarization, I can't imagine. I've got such a strong support system, but there are people out there that are no longer friends with people they grew up with, don't go to holidays with their families. I can't imagine going through what I'm going through without that strong support system. And I'll tell you, Manu, I, I share with people that in my family, we tell the younger generation, if you're dating somebody and they separate you from your friends or your family, you've probably got a problem. But we let politicians do it all the time. And so to me, I'm like, I think the same rule should apply. If, if a political figure is separating you from your friends or your family, you know, you might want to question that situation. It's interesting because you're the, your former mayor of Augusta and uh, as you know, the real focus of this conversation is about the power of local politics on polarization. But before I get there, one of the things that Vic Frankel talks about is that for him, there was a fundamental change in his attitude towards life. It was this notion that we often ask ourselves, what can we expect from life? When in fact, the question that we should be asking ourselves is, what does life expect from us? You know, he gives this very clear example of of this notion of, of suffering. It says, if you're suffering, life is expecting you to persevere through that suffering, to find the opportunity in that suffering, it causes spiritual greatness. I want to get to the politics, but I have to ask you, because I think a big problem in our society right now is such a lack of purposes and, and a feeling of alienation and a feeling of just despair. Like, how do you, how, how do you recommend and provide input to somebody right now that's struggling and that's suffering? You know, I think when you're, when you're struggling, you're suffering, to do for others is part of the healing process. So after I was told that I may have cancer, first thought that goes through your head, am I, am I going to die? I mean, I think that's just human nature. But when my outlook you know, was pretty good because I'm young and healthy, I thought, well, what can I do with this? So one of my best friends is chief of staff at the Georgia Cancer Center here in Augusta. So we were having a cancer walk to raise money for the cancer center. So I was diagnosed three weeks before the walk. But my best buddy, Paul Dallas, said, well, let's form a team. So we did. So we set as a goal to raise $10,000. In three weeks, we raised $53,000. The overall goal for the campaign was seventy five. They raised 116. And so to me, you know, to see that, that that sea of goodwill that I spent nine years in office building, eight years out of office, it's still there. And leading through love and compassion, it shows me that that's sustainable. 
But talk about something that'll lift your spirit. Because those funds, one of the things that the Georgia Cancer Center does is provide world-class care for people that, unlike me, can't afford it. And so to know we've raised five times the amount we were projecting and that those funds are going to help provide world-class care to people that otherwise wouldn't have access to it. Talk about, I mean, a healing part of your spirit just to know that you're helping others. I mean, it's a huge benefit. Can I ask, are you religious by any chance? Do you, I, I do you, am. Has religion been a big part of how you've maintained that sense of hope and goodwill and the spirit of, of deep optimism during this time? Absolutely, unequivocally. But I'll tell you, Manu, I say, you know, I, I have friends of so many different faith traditions, and I'm a Christian. I don't begrudge anybody their faith tradition, but I think even my faith, you know, so in the Christian tradition, we are commanded by God to love our neighbors as ourselves. That does not say, specify your white neighbor, black neighbor. It doesn't even say Christian neighbor. It applies to everybody. So I can still love my Muslim neighbors, you know, gay neighbors, straight neighbors, whatever. If I view everybody as my neighbor, and that to me, you know, in my faith tradition, that's a command that's not a request. So I think if we look at it that way, I mean, and at the center of most religions is love. So that's a common ground that I think, you know, interfaith-wise, we can, everybody, every faith tradition, we still have things in common that we can rally around. Last week, we had Ibu Patel on, um, who, or I think it might have been two episodes beforehand, who mentioned, and he leads an organization called Interfaith America, and it's, it's about the power of religious pluralism and yep. diversity in the country, and it's about how we actually stitch together all these different faith backgrounds to be a part of this perfect union. You've touched on like this idea of leading through love and through leading yep. through compassion, the center of religion being this notion uh, that, it, you know, the power of neighbor, the importance and kindness of neighbor. Why does it seem like at this moment, it almost feels like it's easier to lead through hate and anger than it is to lead through love. Is that true? Is that just a manifestation of the moment? How do you think about that? I, you know, honestly, Manu, and I've thought a whole lot about this. Maybe it's easier, you know, and I tell people it takes much more strength to hold your tongue in restraint than it does to release your tongue in anger. So maybe leading in that way, you get immediate gratification. You get a reaction from somebody. And it used, when I was in office, people would say, you know, how do you not just lose it with your colleagues, you know, in local government? I'm like, part of that is because I'm competitive. And I'm like, I know that's what they want me to do. They want to get a rise out of me. But I think it takes a stronger character not to give people what they want. Maybe it's easier. Maybe it's just mimicking what we've seen. Because for me, you know, I tell people that, you know, hopefully kids are taught in schools, in the family, treat each other with dignity and respect, play well together. And then they come home and they see these political attack ads. And I'm like, what message are politicians sending? I mean, not all politicians. I don't want to paint with the broad bars. But those that use those tactics, fear and intimidation, what message does that send to the next generation? I mean, I think it sends a terrible one. I was talking to uh, to our friend Tom Fishman the other day, and I, I watched something on the news the other night about a kid doing his Eagle Scout project. And I thought, it would be interesting to hear what kids that are trying to become Eagle Scouts think of the action of some politicians. You know, does that speak to what it means to try to be an Eagle Scout? And I would say, and you and I know, it's the very divisive people in Congress that get the most coverage. They're rewarded for bad behavior. But that's just, that's very unfortunate. And I think it sends, it sends the wrong message. I think folks would benefit from us taking a quick step back because I want to get into your story about being a mayor of, of a major city like Augusta, Georgia. And, and, and the fact that you've got a real resume to be able to speak to 
exactly what you're saying. This is not some kumbaya stuff that you're pulling out. You actually led this way. So let's take a quick step back. You said you were mayor, what, eight years ago, right? Nine years ago? Eight years ago. Eight years ago was your last year? Uh, 2014, I was mayor. 2005 through 2014. So nine years. So I got to ask you, Deke, I've never asked you this question, but what motivated you to actually run for office? Why, why get into it? Because I imagine, I mean, I know this, they, you probably had a much more comfortable life doing other things. So why, why get into the hellstorm of politics? You know, that, that is a very good question. So in 2004, I went through a program called Leadership Georgia, oldest statewide leadership program in the nation. So Augusta had a very bad reputation for a very divisive politics. My graduation weekend in November of 2004, we had our current, third current or former elected official go under indictment. Democrats, Republicans, male, female, it, uh, across the board. So our then governor, Sonny Perdue, chief of staff, was on the board of Leadership Georgia. So when I got off the bus in Thomasville, Georgia, he said, what are you guys putting in the water up there? I'm so competitive. It was just the straw that broke the camel's back. And I'm like, man, if a position comes available, I'm going to run for it. Because to travel the entire state and just have people say, what is wrong with your city's politics? I'm like, we need new leadership. We need inclusive leadership, not divisive. And, you know, when you're getting people going under indictment, you know, that's not good. I mean, you've got politicians breaking the law. Well, but, b- before before we get there, I have to ask you, because somebody that's young that's listening to this right now is like, how do I navigate local politics? Why do you think that's supposed to be mayor? You know, there's city council, there's there's superintendent, there's local politics yeah. in and of itself is a fascinating entity. Why, why mayor for you? You know, because it was the first position that came available. Okay. And, okay. But, but it's interesting, Manu, I think, so I was taken, basically after I said I was going to run. I was 37 years old. I was taken in a back room by local business leaders that that I knew and respected, still know and respect to this day. I was told not to run because I had not paid my dues. They told me that, you know, that black people wouldn't vote for me. White people would, I mean, older people wouldn't vote for me. Young people wouldn't vote for me because young people don't vote. And I'm like, I'd been out there engaging at the grassroots level for years, and I thought, they're wrong. But I told them, I'm going to run and I'm going to win, whether your candidate's in the race or not. So going into the, I made the runoff that year in 2005, I was the only candidate going into the general election that had no endorsements whatsoever. But But I'm like, the only endorsement I care about is the people. But... But to hear again, you know, I, but I will say the same group of folks said, you would be the best mayor, but here again, you haven't paid your dues. I'm like, I've run a small business. I've chaired boards of directors. I've held all these leadership positions. So why would being mayor be any different than that? So if rather than dissuading me, it lit a fire in me. And um, so it, and that's what I say. I tell people, For your generation, you know, we had a bunch of 20 and 30-something-year-olds working on that campaign, no clue about how to run a political campaign, but just the positivity and the energy, it was attractive to people, and people rallied around it, because you know what? It was actually, if you can believe this in politics, it was fun. You know, we had a great time. So... You had you have these these business leaders and city leaders saying you haven't paid your dues. People are saying that nobody's going to vote for you, and yet you get into it and you get active, you get out there, you get involved. What gave you the determination to go against conventional wisdom and actually file yourself to run? Because so many people are sitting here right now thinking, "Yeah, man, this is a tough thing to do." What got you going? You know, it's it's funny, and so I told somebody recently. I said. You know, to be young and naive was a good thing. And this was a leadership guru that a friend introduced me to. He said, you weren't naive. You just weren't jaded. So I guess I was not jaded. 
And I really thought I could make a difference. And I, I thought I would win, you know, and I, so I, I just, I did it because I, one thing I knew, so I study city demographics. I mean, I'm, I'm a geek that way. But at that point in time, Augusta was losing population and our tax base was shrinking. So if those trend lines continue over time, you know, Detroit's the worst example of what can happen. But what happens to municipalities is not good. And so I kind of thought, well, if I know this and I don't try to do something about it, then if things go really bad, that's partially on me. I have culpability because I had prior knowledge and didn't try to do anything. So, I mean, I, I had no idea that most people that I knew thought I had no chance of winning. But that was a good thing. What, what, is, what, is, what is one thing? Let me pause actually right there. Man, that's, that's exactly what I hope that the people take away from this conversation. I mean, you just said nobody thought it was going to happen. That's a good thing because I'm going to make it happen. I, I got to ask you when, you, when you were, you know, as you say, young and naive, it's by the way, something I tell myself every day. It helps me <laughs> feel better about myself. So young and naive, 2005, young Deke. Deke is still young for the record, but at that time, really young. Yeah. 2005, you're sitting there, you're thinking about running. What is one thing you would tell yourself after doing this for nine years in 2014 to your 2005 self about the job, about something unexpected, maybe something that you really appreciate, something that you wish you had known? What is one thing you would tell yourself in, in 2005? You know, I'd, probably, I will just say, you know, it's not easy on your family. Now, I did it, I think the, the after I first took office, I went like four months without a day off. I mean, just hitting it as hard as I could. It would probably been maybe a little bit better to set some parameters on the way in because I was, I mean, totally transparent, which that I wouldn't change. But um, it does, I mean, for you to do it 150%, you know, and have a wife. We didn't have kids, but I tell people also, you know, if we'd had kids, that would have been created a different situation. It's almost all the stars had to align, but I think I would have told myself, my 37-year-old self, it's, it is a marathon, not a sprint, and I treated it like a sprint from the beginning. I probably sprinted for nine years, but it seemed to have a good outcome. What do you think? You said you said I, I hope to get into this making a difference. Do you think you made a difference? You know, but I'll tell you, it's so people would tell me that you know you've you've got a thankless job. When I was in office, I'm like, no, that's not the case. Because I continue, I never I mean, sequestered myself or set myself in an ivory tower. I made sure to be out there with the people I served, you know. At the Y every day, going to the grocery store. There wasn't a week that went by that people didn't thank me for what I did, did while I was in office. So eight years out of office, there's not a week that goes by that I don't get that still. And I go back to being able to raise $53,000 in three weeks. You know, that, that goodwill is still there. And it's just... It's a, but it's interesting, just an observation I have. So we had a mayoral race last year, and people wanted me to run again. So I was term limited. But they said, well, if you ran now, you know, you won in landslides before, it'd be an even bigger landslide now. I said, but you know what? In politics, people think a landslide gives you a license to govern. My experience was with your elected colleagues, there's a lot of ego and a lot of jealousy that goes along with that. So if you're the mayor of the people, you know, there's still there are people that go, oh, I'm going to show that guy what for, you know. He might have a huge majority of the people that back him, but I can still keep him from doing this. So there, there's that to deal with, which me, I'm kind of like, I want to see everybody succeed. That's part of what... You know, I'm so thrilled with my relationship with you because I'm like, I want to help your generation 
you know, succeed as much as possible. I want to help lift you guys up. I think that's what my calling is now. But just because I know, you know, I'm sure you still get people saying, well, who does this 20-something-year-old guy think he is, you know, that he's going to solve all these problems? But I'm here to say, you know, leadership knows no age. It just doesn't. And what you're doing is leading and you're inspiring others. And you're doing that at what I think is a great age. Well, I hope my mom hears this because she asks me every day, what am I up to? I gotta, <laughs> I, I gotta ask you this. Uh, and, and it means a lot to me that, that you said specifically this quote, leadership knows no age. You know, there's a Robert F. Kennedy quote that I think I've shared with you before, but I'm not sure, which is about age as well. And it says that, you know, Youth is not a time of life. It's a stage of mind. There's a lot of young old people and a lot of old young people. Yeah. What is something that you want my generation to know? What is a message that you want to give to the young people? Don't let anybody ever tell you you can't do anything. Because I, I hear it. You know, I think ageism has been around forever, right? You know, different generations can be, you know, just not trusting of the ones before or after them, but it's, we all have something to teach each other, but I shouldn't think about it when I say, oh, you know, 20 somethings are whatever generalization you want to make. But I'm like, remember this, that all of the Beatles were under the age of 30 when they broke up. Look at the impact their music is still having on the world. You know, so, and there's, there's so many examples, you know, somebody from a religious perspective, somebody was saying, people forget that like the apostles were all probably historically teenagers or early twenties. And so that just drives me crazy when it's, but I, I faced that in Augusta, you know, I had a local journalist who I love, but for my entire time in office, she called me the boy king, which I didn't mind. <laughs> But, you know, I had somebody that worked for a governmental organization and said, but, you know, you're the, you are the mayor for the younger generation of Augustans. So what do you think that says to them? I'm like, well, I don't really don't care. But I, I get that. But it's almost like in Augusta, it seemed like we had, there was a mindset in some that if you were under the age of 40, you needed to sit at the children's table. And I would tell that journalist, I'm like, now, you're calling me the boy king. I know CEOs that are way younger than me. So I can give you, so Carl Sanders, who was the governor of Georgia, who was from Augusta in the early 60s, I think he was, he was early 30s when he ran and was elected and is a legend in the state. But I'm like, I can give you all these examples of young people who have had this phenomenal impact on the world so don't tell me anybody is too young to have an impact. Yeah, you know, at least you threw in the word king. At least you didn't just stop at boy. She said boy yeah. king. So we, we, we can take that to the bank. You know, I have to tell you that we, I had a, a, a wonderful guest on named Isabel Brown, who's a, who's a social media influencer. I think she was on episode five, if, if the folks want to check it out. And one of the things that she had said, just as you were talking about the age of some phenomenal leaders like the Beatles, I mean, she mentioned that the founding fathers were, you know, when, when the Declaration of Independence was signed, you know, Alexander Hamilton, I think was 21, you know, yeah. uh, Thomas Jefferson was 33, you know, the, the, the average age of, of, of the founders was quite young. So there is a lot of power there. And I love your phrase of leadership knows no age. Let me ask you the contrary, because again, the idea behind the awful majority is we got to push the bounds. We got to be a little yeah. nuanced. So I have yeah. to ask you to the contrary, which is what do you think younger leaders ought to be wary of? What do you think are some of the unique challenges that you face as a younger leader that you might not face as an older leader so that folks can avoid those pitfalls? You know, I, I think it is to understand that you have time. I mean, sometimes there's an immediacy. We've got to change things. We've got to change them now. Change takes time. I mean, it doesn't happen overnight. I think it's best done if you can bridge the generation's and agree we can work together. I mean, I think that's the best way. I'm Here again, I want to lift up your generation, but just to have patience, because what we're talking about, you know, getting away from 
hyper-partisan politics and polarization, we didn't get in this situation overnight. So just be patient, which it's, it's easy to say be patient when people are like, but I want change and I want it now. But, uh, but it will come, but it does, it takes time. You know, it's a, I'll tell you an interesting story. So when I first took office, I couldn't understand why people that had never met me hated me. But over time, what I realized is, I'm like, okay, they don't know me, but they're lumping me into being a typical politician. So after nine years, the same people realized I didn't do it for the reasons of a typical politician. So my support grew and grew over time, but they had to get to know me. And it's understandable. You know, it's easy to make broad-based, you know, visions of something. Okay, well, they're a popular pop politician. I'm going to love them in that. But um, so I, I just say be patient. Yeah, be patient. You know, the difficulty around being patient, of course, and, and by the way, this is speaking to conservatives and liberals alike. You know, when we're talking about change, we just mean, you know, whenever you're somebody that's interested in moving the ball forward, there's some patience required in that. You know, when in my conversation with Ibu, and I think it was episode nine, we talked about how to think about creating change, that oftentimes today there's this impatience towards change, which some might say is justified, some might say is unjustified, that often leads us to the quicker victories. And those quicker victories are often victories around riling people up. Victories, the quicker yeah. path often seems to be the path where we're calling upon not our better angels, but the 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 part of our nature that is more oriented towards hate and and division and anger. Let's go to hyperpartisan politics because you you brought this up and you mentioned the corrosive sort of cancerous effect of polarization yeah. in our society. I mean, as a former mayor, what do you think is the promise of local politics on polarization? Well, I will tell you. So in Georgia, just for your listeners and viewers, all local races are nonpartisan, which I think is a beautiful thing. What does that mean? What does that mean, D? That you don't have to declare a political party when you run for local office. Oh, wow. Okay. But, but ironically, so that's for local governments. So if you're going to run for mayor of a city, city council person, I mean, county commission chairman, you don't have to declare for a party. But strangely enough in Georgia, so sheriffs do have to declare a party along with judges. And it's like, why would you want to make you know, law enforcement the judiciary partisan you know, situations, which yeah. I don't know how that happened. But so I'm like, well, good. I don't have to declare a party. And I will say this, in nine years in office, nobody who had an issue ever called the, when they wanted their problem solved and said, What's your political party? They wanted their problem solved. The problem, I think, sometimes locally in Georgia, not with everybody, but you can have somebody that runs for mayor that wants to go on to higher office, so they might affiliate themselves with the party. I mean, Democrats or Republicans. But I was kind of like, because I'm very pragmatic, I'm like, why would I want to affiliate with a political party and alienate a good percentage of the people I'm serving. Yeah, I want to be there to serve as many people as possible. But so, did you run uh, unaffiliated? Yes. Okay. So, so then the, the where, where my brain naturally goes then is how does one is let's take Georgia as an example and where it is nonpartisan, which is fascinating by the way. That's a really interesting prospect, it, though it feels like we're shooting ourselves in the foot with the notion of, of making law enforcement partisan. But putting that aside for a quick second, as you said, um, how do you balance serving with the ambition for the higher office? How how does one balance that? You know, it's it's interesting. I'm a student of history. And one of my favorite historical figures is George Washington. So I come up with the mindset that we're all supposed to offer. I mean, the country was kind of founded upon the ideal of everybody offering themselves for public service for a certain amount of time, not for a career in politics. I mean, they offered George Washington the opportunity to effectively be king. He walked away from it. 
So that to me, there's a certain nobility in walking away at the height of your powers. And I think it's kind of like professional athletes. Sometimes they hold on way too long, way beyond their shelf life. So I think if you really want to focus, I mean, that's a, people asked if I wanted to run for higher office. And I'd say, look, if I start taking the money from either party, can I really be my own person? So it was very important to me to be able to make my own decisions and to not have to toe the party line on any given issue. So that my independence was more important to me and my integrity than serving in higher office because I, was, I thought if I had to compromise myself. So it, it is a balancing act there. And I think that's there are a lot of good people that offer themselves for public service, but that get caught up in that. You know, and I see it. There are so many people that are partisan politicians that go to Congress, but then it's about, well, you need to run again because if you step down, we're not going to have a majority in Congress. Yeah, so there's a power aspect of it that I, I don't know that everybody understands. You know, I was talking to somebody about it, um, a friend of mine that lives in D.C. over the weekend. My brother headed up a law firm in Georgetown at one point. He said it's just so it's impact politics in D.C. When you have a change of administrations and a change of parties, you're talking about people have to take their kids out of school and have to move. And it's like it's it's a way of life, which is something I think most people don't consider if you don't live in D.C. Well, I have to hold on one thing that you said, which is that my independence and my integrity is more important than running for higher office. Do you think there's something about your character that makes you more likely to feel that way? Do you think it's something about your upbringing? Do you think it's something about your surroundings? Because right now people are saying, why isn't everybody else like Deep that's running for office? So what makes you you on that point? What do you think made George Washington like that? What, what gives you that temperament? It's just that to me is leadership. You know, leadership is about seeking to empower, not seeking power. And I think, you know, it is true. I mean, there's, if somebody gets elected to office, and I know, I mean, we've all got egos to some degree, but, you know, being a mayor or being an elected official comes with some perks, it comes with some recognition. But just to always remember, I mean, that's why, you know, I think leaders tell people what they need to hear, not what they want to hear. And so often I think elected officials, to get reelected, they tell people what they want to hear and they play to the base. And that to me is not leadership. You know, I would rather, if I had to compromise my integrity to win an election or to get ahead in business, I wouldn't want to win. And that's, that's just who I am. And I think that's who my parents raised me to be. Do you think, so, you yeah. could, do you think this is a difficult question, but I got to ask you, cause I, I can't, I'm letting the cur- my curiosity get the better of me, which is, do you think you could run a campaign like you ran in 2005 today and win? Yes, I absolutely do. And I think particularly at the local level. So in 2010, I asked, we were at the height of the Great Recession. I asked people to give money to local charities and not my political campaign because I figured, okay, I've been here for five years. If people don't know me by now, you know, so... I mean, if I raise a bunch of money, it's going to go to TV ads and to mailers that are going to go in the trash can. So do I really need all that money to pay consultants and everything? So, and I felt like at the height of the Great Recession, you know, nonprofits needed money more than my campaign did. But basically, you know, I was on Facebook at that time and basically ran a campaign in a city of 200,000 people on Facebook and $5,000. So the first two years, two times I ran in 05 and 06, we raised like $200,000. But I think with the right candidate, you know, I think that social media, if used in the right way, might have leveled the playing field. You know, and I think your generation too, you know, you've been marketed to your whole lives. 
and you've got tremendous BS detectors that if people are trying to sell you a bill of goods, you know, and the typical, you know, these are the things that a typical politician that, you know, I'm tough on crime. I'm against higher taxes, whatever. You know, I think that does not resonate with your generation. So I think the potential for change is getting greater and greater the more your generation gets into leadership positions. So that gives me hope and optimism. Two questions on this. One is I got to ask the cynic, the cynics question, which is Deke just said he thinks he can win the way he went in 2005 today. You know, there's all these structural factors is the power of party. It seems like on local politics, everybody's talking about national things. It seems like you can't run a race today for mayor without talking about and having a stance in culture war issues like trans rights and LGBTQ community yeah. and free speech and all that stuff. What's your answer to the cynic? You know, it's funny. So my campaign slogan, the day that I announced in 2005, it was on the Augusta Commons, a park downtown, and it was hot as anything. So we brought a bunch of water. And a friend of mine who was also 30-something years old was like giving people water, and he's like, that's you. You're refreshing. Deke Copenhagen, refreshing change. In nine years, people continually said, your message is so refreshing because you're not a typical politician. So I think it's, you know, people will go to an alternative if they're given an alternative. But it's funny, Manu, when I first wrote my book, you know, my, my publisher, my editor with Forbes, um, said, well, you're going to have to appeal to a demographic. And I'm like, you know, I never did that in office. I had a call-in radio show for a year. I just didn't try to go about it that way. You know, I'm going to win by getting at the base of a certain demographic, by inflaming them and getting them mad. So six months in the process of writing my book, the guy said, you know, this is really going to appeal to a broad base of people. So the book ended up becoming a number one bestseller, but the um, like the first couple of weeks it came out, I had a lady locally who's vice chair of the Democratic Party. This was in 2009. She's African-American. She said, I read your book. I loved your book. My 18-year-old daughter loved your book, and you need to run for office again, and I'd vote for you even if you ran with an R in front of your name. So that same week, a guy who knew former President Trump said who was in office at the time, came up to me and said, I loved your book, just went off and all, and all up. I mean, off the, about it, just how much he loved it. And I'm like, do I tell him that the African-American female vice chair of the Democratic Party feels the same? But I'm like, sometimes to find the common ground, you've got to become the common ground. It's that simple. And there's more common ground that unites us. But, <clears throat> so I told my campaign consultant in 2005, I'm like, I'm not going to go negative. I'm not going to say bad things about my opponent. That's just not me. But I think people responded to me not running a typical pol political campaign. I think people will do the same thing now. And I think particularly your generation who, what is it? You know, next year, Gen Z and, um, Millennials would be like 45% of the electorate. I mean, you've got a phenomenal possibility here. A lot of different political people listen to this conversation. 2024 is coming up. You just threw out some really interesting advice, like to find the common ground, you have to be the common ground. You're talking to Republican presidential candidate in 2024. You're talking to Democratic presidential candidate in 2024. Right now, it's looking like it might be Biden and Trump, but whoever the candidates are. What's your advice to them? It's June 2024. How should they be running their campaigns? You know, the, the thing is that drives me crazy about politicians is when they become so ancillary. And I'll just use an example. I've seen so many mayors who were slow to react, you know, Black Lives Matter, whatever. And I could almost sense, well, they're waiting to have an advisor tell them, how's this going to play? into my potential to win the next election. You know, and so they wait too long. They don't go with their gut. And I think that's sort of what, 
you know, presidential candidates get so insular that they get out of touch with the common people. And I'll say with your generation who, oh, by the way, you know, climate issues, LBTQ issues, just all of these things are important to your generation. But I see there are a lot of candidates, particularly I would say at this point on the Republican side, that are tone deaf to issues that matter to your generation. You know, so I would say, particularly with, I, I can't, I'm politically independent, but sometimes it looks to me just analyzing the situation that you know, Republicans are almost writing off your generation to a large degree. And I'm like, it's only a matter of time because before your generation is the voting majority. I mean, that just happens over time. I, I gotta, I gotta say one thing. Just to give credit to some of the some of the Republican and conservative folks out there that are thinking about this. I mean, I had Isabel Brown on Deek, who is a conservative social media influencer. She's, I mean, essentially uh, pushed the billet on how Republicans can be appealing to Gen Z. I mean, you see folks like Vivek Ramaswamy coming out, millennial oh, yeah. candidate. You know, so I think to your point, I think there are folks on across the political spectrum that are thinking about young people. And I often think that when it comes to young people, just to play devil's advocate a little bit, um, because I'm broadly in agreement with you that I think Gen Z is going to become a major voting block as, as our politics continue. The caveat being that I think that if our politics continue to suck, people are losing their, their patience on investing in the system. The problem with democracy is oxygen. Your oxygen is participation. And as you... Yeah. Suck away participation, suck away oxygen, democracy withers. But I will say that there is a lot of, you know, thought diversity within my generation on a lot of these issues. I don't think most of Gen Z is democratic. In fact, I think it's a mistake that a lot of folks make. But I think the only way we get to that is through nuanced dialogue about these issues. Were you going to say something? Yeah, no, I I agree with you. And I think that's why, you know, I feel to be such a kindred spirit to your generation and the other younger generations. So being politically independent. Now, I agree with you. I've got some conservative views. I've got some more liberal views. And I think most of the people that I talk to are more, more in certain situations, not to say everybody, they're more fiscally conservative and more socially liberal. And to me, my views on that are shaped by my faith. I'm like, I think... If people are unable to take care of themselves, then we should take care of them. Combination of, you know, nonprofits, churches, houses of worship, and the government. You know, if people can't take care of themselves, but also believe that people are able bodied and they can work, they should. So that's pretty simple. But I agree with you, and I'll tell you, you know, I'm excited about the potential for the forward party, but I do, I want to see both the Democrats and Republicans going forward be viable because I think it's a terrible thing for democracy if one or the other just became the dominant political party because then you're stifling viewpoints. You know, I think that's a bad thing for democracy. And I'd love, I'd love to, you know, I've got my own podcast. I want to get your views on that. I know. Well, hey, you and I had a conversation last on your podcast. What was it in, in October? And man, how time yeah. flies. I got to ask you, I want to pivot away from politics for a quick second and go personal. And then I, I'm going to I'm going to respect your time and let you go because I know I could keep asking questions all day long. But keep at it, man. I, I, I have to ask you a deeply personal question. You don't have to answer this if you don't want to. But as a political leader, as a business leader, your voice is really important. Yeah. You know, voice matters. It's something I think a lot about, you know, without my words, without my voice, I I really am put in a position where I have to wrestle with and think about, again, how I think about the meaning to life. And again, part of the show is to have those personal and honest conversations to show, not just tell people that those in leadership also struggle. And, and, oh, and, yeah. and that struggle is necessary. How have you coped with, you know, a risk to your voice, given how important your voice has been to your life? Man, that is a great question. So this started in February of this year. So I've dealt with this voice for how many months now. And I remember the first podcast I did after this hit, I'm like, man, 
am I going to be able to continue to do this? And I've done keynotes with my voice like this, but I think, and we talked before coming on air, that in communication, it's connection is more important than perfection. And I tell people, my voice is not going to hit perfection. I really like the way my voice used to sound, and I will have surgery on a vocal cord to get it back. But it is so important. I think I I told somebody on another podcast I did, I said, I think maybe having this voice gives me more street cred than I had before. Because people know that you got to, it's kind of a labor to do this, but I'm not going to let anything silence me. And so, and I've seen, you know, unfortunately, this does not hurt me, but I would hope that people would understand that's how important this is to me. You know, I'm, I'm in a good position in my life from a, my wife and I are, you know, mid fifties, we get to travel a lot, we get It kind of goes back to what you said about running for office. I didn't necessarily have to do that at 37 years old, but this is a life's work to me. And I will tell you, it scares me half to death to see what is going to happen if we don't do what we're doing. I happen to believe that the majority of people out there really want to become a part of the bridging movement. And they don't want to be made to feel afraid of their neighbors. I see this movement catching hold wherever I go. Whenever I talk to people about it, they're excited. But I'll tell you this one. So, you know, over 500 bridging organizations in the United States doing phenomenal work. How many of them do you see often in the mainstream media? I mean, what Braver Angels did in Gettysburg with their convention, how much media coverage did that get? So we've got all these great things going on, but so many people don't even know that they're going on. I think part of leadership is to provide people hope, which you were doing through this podcast, is to educate people. Because if you're just watching the mainstream media, it would look like we're horribly divided (laughs) and that there's no way to fix this. Mm -hmm. I believe there is. That's right. And you're, Your voice is doing that. Hopefully mine's helping to do that. But joining all our voices together, man, how powerful is that? So my voice doesn't always have to be perfect as long as I can join it with yours and others. They're not taking your voice away, brother. They're not taking your voice away. And I mean, not only do we need your voice, but your voice motivates so many people um, and it provides a real sense of purpose. And And I want you to know that. And it, it demonstrates again the value and the power of the fact that we got to break through our echo chamber. You know, oddly enough, we've created a bubble of bridge builders, which is very odd. But that's for another topic. I got to ask you one last question. It's a question I ask every single guest. You've kind of gotten into this a little bit, and it's a question about the power of why. You know, Nietzsche once said that understanding your why enables anybody to get through their how. Uh, Vic Frankel talks about the the power of purpose. You know, you mentioned briefly that. You know, this is your life's work. What is your why? And why is this your life's work? Because I think people deserve better. I mean, I think people deserve hope. You know, I just, it frustrates me so much. I mean, I just believe in people. I mean, I'm out there engaging at the grassroots level. I think most people are pretty good people. And here again, they don't want to be made to be afraid of their neighbor. They don't, I mean, Fear is a power, fear is the most powerful motivator, but love is most is a powerful motivator as well. And so, you know, to join together with those people in the cancer walk here from all walks of life and to see, you know, the hope created by people coming out and supporting their loved ones, that's that's as addictive to me as power is to some people. I mean, seeing that you're making a difference. And that you're making somebody's life a little easier. And, you know, this stuff doesn't happen overnight. You asked me during one conversation we had, said, well, you've been basically been bridge building your entire adult life. And and this is before my cancer hit. Sometimes you've got more energy than people my age. So what gets you through? But if you remember, 
So I told you about University of Texas El Paso Student Engagement and Leadership Center. They um, found my book, you know, organically in the fall of 2019. And so I didn't know they had until students are throwing up pictures on Instagram of them reading my book. So I reached out to them and went out there and spoke in March of 2020, right before, you know, everything went crazy. But you said to me, you said, man, we've got a chapter there. I said, when I first found out about Bridge USA was in January of 2020 in an op-ed in USA Today. So when I went and spoke at UTEP, I suggested, I'm like, hey, man, I just found out about this organization. You guys might want to take a look at becoming a part of Bridge USA. So you said, man, we've got a chapter there now. I'm like, so here again, having patience. So they found my book in 2019. You and I had that conversation three years later in 2022. We're a year down the road after that. But, you know, I didn't have any clue. I had planted a seed. Did I have any clue that they had a Bridge USA chapter there now? But I'm like, when you find out that those seeds that you've planted have come to fruition, which, you know, you're going to find out sometimes, not all the time. That's what makes everything we do worthwhile. There is such satisfaction in that. It's like, man, I made a difference and it's going to be around a lot longer than I'm going to be. Thank you, Deke. Thank you. You know, the, the power of local politics, the, the power of planting the seeds and seeing their fruition, uh, the, the value of, of stubborn, sometimes naive optimism is what gives us, I would say, meaning to life. And so I'm grateful to you and thank you for being on. Well, man, I appreciate it. Maybe one last thing that's so cool. I, so I made it a point to speak in, in schools every opportunity I got for nine years. And so people would say, why are you speaking in schools Kids don't vote. I'm like, because it's important for them to know that they've got a mayor that cares about them. Now, those kids in Augusta are 20 and 30 something year old leaders in the community. They come up to me and go, hey man, do you remember when you came and spoke to me when I was in the third grade? How cool is that? Nothing beats it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that rerun of a conversation from way back in August of 2023 a message that, yes, now it's March 2024, even more relevant. Yes, we're all got to focus on President Biden. We got to all focus on former President Trump. We got to focus on what happens in November 24. But remember, oftentimes the democracy that actually touches us at home, that touches our kids, that touches our family is at the local level. And now is more important than ever for us to get engaged, to exercise our voices, to have productive dialogues, to rebuild our relationships. Every Monday, YouTube, Spotify, Apple. I'll catch you next week because we've got a really exciting conversation with a busy news week. With that, let's keep it close. I'll see you next week.